I'd like to start by thanking the Kerala Shastra Sahitya Parida for inviting me to speak to you today at the inaugural session of your annual meeting. It's a pleasure to be with you virtually and I hope that in the future I will have the opportunity to come to Kerala and meet with you in person. We are living in a time that is very unusual. This is not something that any of us have seen in our lifetimes. And it is interesting that when we look backwards, we think about the outbreaks that have happened previously that affected the whole world, that are written in our history books. And we don't always get the complexity of what happened, how people lived their daily lives and what the challenges were. What we are living through today will be in the history books that are read a hundred years from now. And it is important for us to understand that recording these events and making sure that they are recorded clearly and objectively is very important. We must have clarity in what really is happening. What are the things that we are doing right? What are the things that we are doing wrong? Whether the results of what we see in terms of the spread of the virus and the solutions that we find, are they a matter of doing the right thing? Are they when we go wrong? What happens then? And are there situations in which we have just been lucky? If we think about India, and what has been happening here. In India, we first saw the virus in Kerala, the first three detections at the end of January were identified early through a proactive screening mechanism and they did not spread to anyone in the population. After that, when screening was expanded to other parts of the country, we looked for the virus at the points of entry in airports. And here is where we started to see the virus come in in March. And we traced the contacts of people who were identified there. But within three weeks, we had more than 500 cases and this is when we had the government declare the lockdown. The lockdown was intended to be for just a few weeks. It was extended and extended again. And even now there are restrictions on what people can do and how people behave. Have these approaches been successful? Was there a point in doing this? Is something that everybody asks. And I think the questions instead are, what is it that we were trying to achieve? What happened to those goals, as well as what were the unintended consequences of the lockdown? If we think about what we were trying to achieve, the goal was to try and delay having the spread of infection so that the healthcare system could be ready to handle any problems that arose. Did that happen? There have been modeling studies that show that there was a delay in the spread and that is what you would expect when people do not gather together, then transmission will slow down. But there were a lot of unintended effects as well. And this was shown by the tragedy of the migrant workers who really had to struggle there to reach their homes and where the economic impact is going to be with us for years to come. 
Now, if we look at things that were done right, initially there was a lot of discussion around how to scale the testing, what testing should be done, should we bring in antibody tests. But ultimately what we have settled on is the idea that detection of the virus is important being able to trace contacts is important and if you can isolate people and get them to stay away from others for two weeks we will suppress replication of the virus and further transmission now this is the simplest methods of containing any infectious disease stopping its spread and we do it by very simple measures which is to make sure that we identify those who are infected and stop them from spreading to others. The problem with this infection is that frequently we don't always know who is infected and who is not infected. In infected people for up to two days before they start to have symptoms, they could be spreading infections and it's also possible that there is infection being spread by people who never develop symptoms of the disease. The proportion that is asymptomatic varies in different estimates from somewhere around a quarter of those infected to up to 40 to 60 percent depending on age group may never have symptoms of the disease yet be infected and spread infection. So that's why making sure that we test, trace and isolate is important. But in addition to that, the other control measures include the wearing of masks, the maintaining of a distance as well as washing hands. Now, what is the evidence base for these interventions? Test, trace and isolate has been shown to limit spread both in direct studies as well as by modeling. And if we look at mask wearing, there are ecological studies that show us that wearing of masks by the population does decrease the spread of infections. So these kind of strategies that are recommended as public health measures are not perfect, but they are good and they do prevent or slow down the spread of infections. However, there are other strategies that have been recommended, have been discussed widely by people and in the media. And the evidence base that we have for these is somewhat lacking, if we can even say that. If we look at what was recommended as an approach to getting rid of the virus, UV lights and bleach that resulted in some people actually drinking bleach and a person dying because of that. There is absolutely no evidence that these are treatments. Bleach and UV light can be used for cleaning, can be used for sterilizing or sanitizing an environment, but these are not treatments in any shape or form. If we think about what has been recommended in India as well, early on we had pictures of people who were taking gobar baths. There are many Ayurvedic therapies that have been recommended as treatments as well. Now, if we look at those, there is absolutely no evidence that these work for prevention or for treatment. It is possible that there are certain herbs and drugs that may be what are called immunity boosters but in terms of seeing whether these actually result in the prevention of infection of SARS coronavirus 2, 
there has been no scientific evidence that has been generated so far. I think I'm not against any kind of traditional medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, the multiple plural systems of medicine that we have in India may all very well have benefits. We know that there are approaches that are taken in India that do promote health, but in terms of evaluating them as interventions for a specific infectious agent or as treatment for that specific infectious agent, I think we would do ourselves a disservice if we did not hold those approaches and treatments to the same bar that we have for what is called allopathic or Western medicine. Even within Western medicine, if we look at the many treatments that have been tried, there is a difference between thinking theoretically that something will work and actually testing to see whether it works or not. In the early days, a number of drugs were tried for treatments. In China, in the first two months, 120 clinical trials were registered. Most of those trials did not wind up recruiting enough patients, so we did not get answers from the experimental therapies that were tried in China. So, Nonetheless, what happened was that many of the treatments that were tried early in China began to be evaluated in other parts of the world as well. Some of these included drugs that had been shown to work against SARS coronavirus 2 or against SARS coronavirus, the original virus, as well as against other coronaviruses. Now, something that works in the laboratory may not necessarily work equally well in human beings. That's why doing clinical trials to generate the evidence is very important. So a number of studies were started to look at these. They looked at drugs that are used for HIV. They looked at drugs that are being used for malaria. They looked at drugs that modify the immune system and they looked at new antiviral drugs that had been developed for other coronaviruses as well. Now, when trials were done with these drugs, we wound up with a problem that had been seen previously in China that many of the trials that were done were very small trials and could not give a definitive answer. But there have been at least two large studies that have been done that have resulted in clear answers for certain kinds of drugs for treatment. And these are two studies, one done in the UK called the recovery trial, which showed us that steroids, dexamethasone, worked in decreasing mortality in patients with severe disease who were hospitalized. Recovery, the study has shown us subsequently that some drugs did not work against SARS coronavirus 2 when it was severe. Similarly, another study by the World Health Organization has just had its results published. And if we look at the top line results of these two studies, we have the evidence that dexamethasone does save people when they are severely ill. However, if we look at other drugs, lopinavir, ritonavir, which were designed for HIV, that does not work as a treatment. Hydroxychloroquine, which was widely recommended as a prophylactic in India, does not prevent severe disease or prevent mortality. 
Similarly, interferon, which was being tried in severe disease in the solidarity trial, does not appear to reduce the risk of death. Remdesivir was developed as an antiviral drug by Gilead, first tried for Ebola, it did not work there, and then tried for MERS, where it showed a good effect in the laboratory. Remdesivir has been evaluated by the National Institutes of Health in the US, and it has been shown that remdesivir can reduce the duration of hospitalization by five days. However, in the WHO solidarity trial, remdesivir did not prevent mortality in that study. So that just tells us that depending on the drug, the patient population, the stage of disease that we are treating, in order to have really good, strong evidence, we need to do a lot of studies. We have preliminary evidence on remdesivir now to show us that there may be some effect, but to define the size of that effect is going to take more studies. If we do scientific studies like this, when the design is right, when the size is right, we can come up with answers that allow us not only to get to a good treatment like dexamethasone, it also stops us from wasting unnecessary time and effort on giving people treatments that do not work for their stage of illness. So for now, we should not be thinking about hydroxychloroquine or thinking about lopinavir, ritonavir being used for patients with severe disease. This kind of evidence gathering in the context of a pandemic is a challenge, but it is also an ethical requirement when we have a new disease, it is very, very important that we make sure that we generate the evidence that will serve our patients well. Tomorrow's treatments come from today's experiment and science and evidence are the tools that we must use to take us to tomorrow. In addition to the work that is being done on drugs, there is also a lot of work that is going on on the prevention of disease, particularly through the use of vaccines. We have never had a time before where so much work has been done so fast on so many candidates as in the last nine months. As somebody who really believes in vaccines and the potential of vaccines to prevent diseases, this is something that I think is truly remarkable. We are really moving the vaccine research field forward very fast. There are all kinds of vaccines that are being tried every platform technology that can be used to develop a vaccine is being used. If we look at what kinds of vaccines we had before SARS coronavirus type 2, most of the vaccines that we had relied on us having the whole infectious organism or part of the infectious organism delivering that to people, usually by injection, but sometimes through an oral vaccine, and making sure that the human immune system could respond to that vaccine by making a protective immune response. Usually this protective immune response consists of antibodies which can be measured in the blood of a person who has been vaccinated or infected. Where we are now is that we have vaccines that are being made with whole organisms that are either living or and weakened or are inactivated or killed. 
we have vaccines that are based on proteins either proteins by themselves or proteins given in the form of a whole virus like particle we also have rna vaccines and dna vaccines where we take bits of nucleic acid make it code for the protein and then use that to deliver into the cell of the human then the human cell becomes like a factory making the virus protein and the immune system can respond to that we also have another clever way of using other viruses to carry the sequence of the protein into the human host so that you can the human can respond to that protein that is produced by the virus infecting the host cell now all of these technologies are being used to make vaccines there are over 300 projects around the world that are looking at making vaccines of these 40 projects have already reached the stage of human testing which means that they have gone past the cell culture stage the testing in animals and now moved into humans we have almost a dozen vaccines that have gone through the first two stages of human testing which is looking at safety and whether an immune response is made and are now in phase 3 studies in phase 3 we will get answers as to whether these vaccines actually prevent disease in people who have been vaccinated it is likely that we will get results from probably about 3 vaccines by the end of this year and if we have good news that the vaccines work then there will be a huge effort to make a lot of vaccine so that it can be distributed around the world there is a lot of discussion going on now about who should get the vaccine first and how these vaccines can be delivered it's very important to remember that if we look at vaccination programs around the world in places like india and other developing countries we almost never give vaccines to anyone other than children and pregnant women so if we now have to deliver vaccines to people who need them the most which is people who are elderly people who have comorbidities then just identifying who these people are is going to be a challenge reaching them is the next challenge getting the vaccines made is a challenge distributing the vaccines is a challenge as well but it's going to be something that can potentially change how we deal with this infection the prevention of disease if we can protect the bulk of people who are given vaccination then that will allow us to think about bringing our lives closer back to what we knew in 2019 rather than what we have dealt with in 2020 once we have vaccines it's also very important for us to think about how we get the maximum benefit out of the idea of prevention in many parts of the world there is a belief that vaccines are somehow dangerous that vaccines are unnecessary in the haste to make vaccines for sars coronavirus 2 a lot of pressure was put on vaccine companies on researchers to make the vaccines quickly fortunately for us the researchers the regulators have resisted that pressure and said that we will only provide vaccines when we are confident that these vaccines are safe these vaccines are of high quality 
and these vaccines work. This is very important for building trust in vaccines and making sure that people who really need to get these vaccines are not given the wrong messages and told that these vaccines either will not work or that they may be dangerous. The system has been established for regulation to make sure that benefits are maximized and risks are minimized as much as possible. So as scientists, as people interested in public health, as people interested in the welfare of society, it's very important for all of us to communicate that when vaccines come, they will be a very good tool for promotion of public health and for the prevention of disease in the people who need them the most. We will start with the healthcare workers who really need protection because of their high exposure, with the elderly and those with comorbidities because they are most at risk of developing severe disease and then think about the rest of the population. We are very lucky that India has an outstanding vaccine industry consisting of private players who, despite the fact that they are private players, have been responsible for providing an unimaginable service to public health in India and beyond. Because they make high quality but affordable vaccines, India's vaccine manufacturers now provide something like 60% of the vaccines that are used in routine childhood immunization in low and middle income countries. I hope that this is a service that they will continue to do for the world for SARS coronavirus 2 as well. Our vaccine industry now has four candidates that are in human studies. Some of these have come from indigenous research. The Covaxin made by Bharat Biotech is based on an Indian strain. The other vaccines that are in clinical trials in India have come from partnerships that our vaccine industry has had with other parts of the world. Despite that, all of the development of these vaccines is being undertaken in the country. And I hope that this will proceed smoothly, making sure that there is both safety and efficacy being examined during the vaccine trials. While all this research goes on, when we think about what is happening in our country, it is remarkable what we have managed to come through so far. If we think about it, the number of cases that we have seen in India has crossed 7 million. It's likely to continue to increase, even though for the past few weeks, the pace at which we have been increasing has slowed down and has now started to decrease as well. Currently, we are seeing less than 60,000 cases being reported every day and we hope that this trend continues. In other parts of the world, there has been not such a good picture because there has been a peak, it has come down and now the numbers are starting to increase again. So it's important for us to continue to be on our guard, make sure that we continue to follow the precautions that are required that we know work, wearing masks, social distancing, and making sure that hygiene is maintained, in addition to following the principles of test, trace, and isolate. While we continue to do this and await the improvement of drugs and the coming of vaccines, 
It's also very important for us to think about what the last few months have meant for all of our society. With the lockdown, we saw the damage that was done to people, to populations, and within the population, particularly to our young and to the women. Our children have been out of schools and colleges for a while. That's okay, feels like a holiday, even if it's without friends for the first week, the first two weeks. But when the weeks turn into months, we recognize how much damage it is doing, both in terms of an inability to grow in the same fashion. No matter how much we do online, the engagement with others, the learning together is a key feature of intellectual and social growth for our young people. So ensuring that they don't lose out on this cognitive and social development is a key part of what we must ensure for the future. If we look at what has been happening to women during this time, job losses in the informal economy have impacted women much more than men. Job losses in the formal economy have e impacted women much more than men. And this is coming at a time by our cultural constructs where women are having to shoulder an increased workload at home, looking after families, looking after the elderly and the unwell. There has been significant damage done to women's health because access to services was not available. If we look at the proportion of home births, they went up significantly in April and May. If we look at what is happening to antenatal care, that is not being delivered to pregnant women. If we look at who is coming into hospitals for treatment, it's still a majority of men. So whether it is on the social front, the economic front, or the health front, women have really taken a hit in all dimensions. So if we need to think about what can be done to ensure that women can make back some of the losses that they have had. That is going to require proactive decisions by the government, proactive emphasis on restoring the role of women in society and in employment in the time to come. If I think about women in science and the position that has been taken, it is unfortunate that when we look at both scientific journals, look at media, the role of women who have expertise in areas that are related to public health has not really been emphasized. Most of our spokespersons, most of our experts have really been men. Making sure that we have a lens that examines gender in every aspect of all that we do. If we look at society, if we look at our professions, if we look at science, it is critically important that we continue to measure and monitor this because it really matters to ensure that society allows for an equitable and a diverse group of individuals to contribute, not just to public health, but to the lives that we live. I'd like to end again by thanking all of you for your attention and I look forward to a discussion today 
online, but in future in person. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'd like to start by thanking the Kerala Shastra Sahitya Parida for inviting me to speak to you today at the inaugural session of your annual meeting. It's a pleasure to be with you virtually and I hope that in the future I will have the opportunity to come to Kerala and meet with you in person. We are living in a time that is very unusual. This is not something that any of us have seen in our lifetimes. And it is interesting that when we look backwards, we think about the outbreaks that have happened previously that affected 